All right. Hey, um, we're here uh, for doing magnetism and AP physics. Specifically, what we're looking at today is looking at using the Lorentz force. Um, and specifically, uh, this first part is going to be about using QV cross B, the Lorentz force, but using the right hand rule to figure out the directions of the force. Um, we're also going to take a look at force on a current, current carrying wire. So uh, let me actually start with that derivation real quickly. So what we're using. Uh, pardon the weird lighting, mood lighting here. I'm going to be using uh, this to project up these diagrams so I can draw on the diagrams in a little bit. So here we go. So you say, hey, the first formula we're using uh, is the formula for the Lorentz force. That's the force on a charge that's moving across magnetic field lines. Uh, force is QB cross B. Um, and what I want to talk about is the fact that uh, in these problems, for example, this first one, we don't have individual charges cutting across magnetic field lines. Instead, what we have going on here is we have current in a wire, and that wire is going across the field lines. You say, well, okay, well, the current, that's moving charges. So if the charges are moving down the wire, they're going across the field lines, they should get shoved by the Lorentz force. So how do we calculate that force on the wire? I can calculate the force on individual little charges, but I want to know the force on the charges in the wire. You say, well, again, those charges aren't going to like leap out of the wire. The whole wire gets shoved, uh, whichever direction it happens to be. Okay, so maybe that way. Uh, but the point is, you say, hey, uh, let's figure out how we get that equation for the force on a current carrying wire. It's pretty straightforward, actually. We're going to use this equation, and we're going to use this other, like, little used equation. There's an equation that we developed last unit for current in terms of the motions of the little bit of charges in the wire. We say, hey, if I've got this uh, great big chunk of wire here, I've got some charged particles that are moving down the wire, right? Actually, it's probably electrons going the other way, but you get the idea. The point is there's some charged particles moving. Each of these little particles has a certain amount of charge on it, Q, right? Um, and there's a certain amount of charge, uh, basically density in here, of these charge carriers, these particles that carry charge down the wire. Um, you know, if this was a fluid, maybe these would be like uh, charged ions dissolved in the fluid. I might have positive charges flowing one way and negative ions flowing the other way. They can have both going on at the same time. But uh, in this case, we're just going to deal with these charge, car charge carriers. Now, the formula that we developed was how much current I have. It depends on how many of these charge carrying particles there are, how densely packed they are in the wire, right, in this material. So we used this variable, all right? And that was the charge carrier density. Okay, so that was my these particles that are charged, charge carriers per volume. Okay, it's how densely packed they are. Um, we also included um, the charge of the, char of, the, of the charge carriers. Now, when I do this, I like to just call that Q. The AP exam, the formula on the AP formula sheet. Uh, instead of using Q, they specifically wrote it for those charges being either protons or electrons. Remember the charge on a proton or electron is called an elementary charge, that 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, that's an elementary charge, and they use this symbol E uh, for the charge on an elementary charge. Um, technically, we could put a Q and have any kind of ions moving, not just protons and electrons, but that's why I like my version better than theirs. But anyway, they use that. Uh, then we have V. That's the drift velocity. We know that these particles in the wire, they're not just moving in a nice straight line. They're moving and wiggling, jiggling, bouncing off things, making their way down through the resistance of the wire. So the path that any one particle might take, right, that path might be like bouncing off things. But over time, it's generally drifting downstream at some speed, this drift velocity, right? The absolute speed is like super fast, right? Du -du 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 -du. But on the average, it's just going down speed at some rate. That's that drift velocity. And the last variable that we cared about is the cross-sectional area of the wire. Okay? A. All right? So on the AP formula sheet, the formula looks like NEVA. All right? That's the formula for the current in terms of the motion of these individual little charge-carrying particles. Okay. So N is my charge carries per volume. E is really, like I said, I would write it as a Q. It's my charge per charge carrier. How much charge each one of those ions has. Then I have my velocity and my cross-sectional area. Okay, so drift velocity, cross-sectional area. Okay, so I just wrote out those words. Now, 
check this out. If I take charge carries per volume times my charge per charge carrier, you see what's going to happen, right? Charge carries, charge carries. I just get charge per volume, right? You know, enough of this E. I'm going to write this Q because I like Q. So this is my charge per volume. Q per volume. Yeah? Times drift velocity times cross-sectional area. Okay? The drift velocity on the average is how fast they're going downstream here. Okay, now, going to do something else clever. Hey, volume. How do you find the volume of a chunk of this wire? You say, the, amount that, the chunk that had that many charge, that was charging it. You say, well, that chunk of it, right, that volume, right, wouldn't the volume be like some length times the cross-sectional area would give you the volume? So volume there, that's really length times cross-sectional area. You say, but wait a minute, drift velocity, and then I have area here. Hey, area and area are going to bang, bang. What have I got now? I've got charge times how fast those charges are moving down the wire divided by the length. That's the current. Let's move that L to the other side. IL is Q times the average speed they're going down the stream with. You say, no, wait a minute. QV, oh, QV, that's IL. What's our force? Our force is IL cross V. And that's the formula for the force on a current carrying wire. Okay, derived from uh, the Lorentz force and this equation for current in terms of the motion of the charge down the wire. Okay, so that's the, that's the derivation for you real quickly in that. Okay, so we say, looking at the equation real quick, uh, once again, what does it depend on? How hard the wire gets shoved depends on how many charges are running through it, right? The more charges per second crossing field lines, the more force you have. So we care about how much charge per second is going. The length, we care about how much wire is in the field. If I'm looking at this wire here, charges here and here and here and here and here, all along that length, they're all getting yanked, right? So I care how much wire is in the field, that length. This length also gives me a vector. Okay, there'll be a vector going along the length in the direction of the current. Specifically, that's what this L is. I isn't a, isn't a vector, so I can't do a cross product with I. So I really needed to invent a new vector. So I have this, this L vector that goes along the direction of the current. Right, that's the length of the wire in the field. Um, and then B, of course, is the magnetic field strength. It makes sense, the more field lines per area, um, how more densely packed they are, the stronger the B field is, right, the stronger the B value is. And so if they're more densely packed, I'm cutting more of them per second. It makes sense I'll get a bigger force. The cross product means we care about the angle, right? There's a sine theta hiding in there. And it's the angle between the way the current's flowing down the wire, the length of the wire, and the B field lines, right? So if I'm going cross perpendicular to each other, that's going to be the biggest possible sine of 90. That'll be 1. That's my biggest value for sine. I'll get the maximum force on the wire when it cuts straight across the field lines. If it's going parallel, of course, my force would be zero and so on. Okay, here, let's go ahead, let's apply our two formulas, right? And our right-hand rule for direction of the force um, to these problems, okay? Now, at this point, I don't know how clearly you can see this projection. I think it's not bad. On the camera, this looks not too bad. I wonder what happens if I give us mood lighting. Will it be easier to read or harder to read? So here we go. Mood lighting on three, two, one. What do you think? Physics by candlelight, better or worse? What do you think? You're going to say six of one, half a dozen of the other, right? They're about the same, yeah? What do you think? Do it in the dark? No comments. It makes me look better. All right, here we go. Uh, in the dark, here we go. Hey, here's my current going to the right. Now, I see a bunch of dots here for B field, right? Those B field, I'm seeing a bunch of dots. What do the dots mean? The dots mean it's the B field lines are coming out of the page towards you. That's like the tip of the arrow, the arrow point coming towards you, so it's coming out of the page. My name coming out of the page, current going to the right. I'm going to use my right hand roll. I'm doing I L cross B, L cross B. L is along the current. Here we go. Which way I need my hand? I make my right hand, making a mitten. Fingers go along the first vector, that L, that length along the current, going to the right. Which way do I want to orient my hand? My fingers are still going to the right, but I need it so that when I bend the fingers, they point along the second vector, along B. B is coming out of the page, so I need my hand like this. My right hand, always right hand. On current, curl into B, where my thumb goes, down, that's the way the force is. So the magnetic force on that wire is down. Okay, 
Uh, problem two. Here I see a bunch of dots. Da, 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 da. That's again, that's magnetic field lines coming out of the page. I can see my current is going upward like that. Here we go. We are crossing those field lines that we're going across them. Yeah. So we're going to get pushed. Here we go. We're going to do I L cross B L, which we don't need my hand to turn. Now, fingers along the first vector, along the length, <coughs> in the direction of the current. I want my fingers to bend so they point along B, along the second vector, L cross B. So like this, my thumb points to the right. That's the direction that wire gets yanked. Uh, question three. Uh, this time, those are actually little X's. Hard to see on the screen, but these are X's. X, 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 X. So it's a magnetic field going away from you into the page. You're seeing like the feathers, the back end, the fletchings of the arrow as it goes away from you into the page. We see that cross. So you say, that's it. Big field going into the page. Current going to the right. Make a right hand rule. Fingers along the first vector, IL. Curl. So my thumb points along B into the page away from me. Thumb points up. That's the direction of the product. Magnetic field going up. Again, more X's. Current going down. Right hand rule, fingers along the first vector. Which way do I need my hand to turn? So when the fingers bend the point on the second vector along B, that means I actually have to get my hand like this. Uh, v cross into B, thumb points to the right. This is something that I really, really, really recommend. You do the right hand rule with your hands, okay? Don't be trying to do it up in your head yet. There's no need. Okay, do use your right hand to do this, all right? <laughs> I'm not gonna say that's what your right hand is there for, but, um, but, but you do the right hand rule. Um, have you seen that site, Flippin' Physics? The guy says, don't be too cool for the right hand rule. Take your time, drop what you're right. If you're righty, you always have to set down what you're writing into your hand and do the right hand rule. If you're busy writing, you use your other hand, everything's gonna be backwards. So you use your right hand. Here we go, uh, problem five. This time I've got, it says I next to this dot. You know what that is? That's a wire with the current coming out towards you. And B field line is going to the right. So here we go. Fingers along the first vector, I, that's out of the board. Right? Which way do you need my hand to face? You say, I need to face that when the fingers bend, they'll point to the right along B. I need my hand like this. I out of the board, cross B, thumb is up. This wire gets yanked upward. Uh, six. I've got an X there in current. The current is going into the page away from me. Magnetic field line is going to the left. So fingers go into the board. Which way do my hand to face? So when the fingers curl, they curl on the second vector on B. I, I all cross B. Thumb points up. Seven, I've got, what the heck is that? Seven, I've got this current coming out of the page and field lines going down. Current, there's a dot that's coming out of the page. So again, my fingers need to point out. Which way do I need my hand to face? You say, I need to face them. When the fingers bend, they point down. That's going to be like this. And bend, drip. Thumb points to the right. That's the way that force, or the magnetic field goes, Lorentz force. Uh, eight. I've got this wire going kind of diagonal up and to the right, but it's crossing these B field lines going down. So fingers along the first vector along I. Which way do I need it to face so that when the fingers bend, they'll end up bending to point down along B? Well, this doesn't work. This doesn't. You're right. This is pointing against B. I got to have my hand like this. So kind of diagonal, right? And they curl the point along B, and my thumb points into the board. The force is in to the page. Okay? All right, it's going into the page there. All righty. Uh, nine. I got a current going diagonal to the right. And it made feel going up and diagonally right. Uh, so you say, okay, here we go. I L cross B forces out of the page. Little dot, the magnetic force coming out of the page there. That wire gets yanked towards you. And then uh, what's this one? That is question 10. I see a bunch of dots. So that's a magnetic field coming out of the board. And there's an X, that's a current going into the board. And you say, hey, magnetic field's going out, current going in. They're not crossing each other. They're going anti-parallel to each other. We're not crossing field lines. There is no force, all right? So there is zero force, magnetic force on that wire there. Uh, question uh, 11 here uh, says, hey, I've got a dot here, current's coming out of the page, magnetic field's going diagonally up and up and left. So you say, hands gotta come, fingers go out with the current, right? I, L, now we're gonna cross into B, which is my hand to face? It's gotta go like this. So the fingers curl to point along B. I cross B, thumb is down and to the left. 
remember that force is perpendicular to B and perpendicular to I, right? It's perpendicular to both, the, uh, the L, the length of the wire and the B field. It's got to perpendicular to both at the same time. Uh, what's this one? Number 12. Uh, looks like we've got a current going into the page. I see an X there. A magnetic field's going down. And so you say, okay, into the page, which way is my hand face so the fingers will bend down? It's going to be like this. I, B, force to the left. Okay. Uh, what do we got here? That makes us 13. I see a bunch of dots, I think. That's magnetic field coming out of the page. And it says proton going to the right. So magnetic field's coming out of the page. A single, single charge going to the right. You say, hey, we're doing QV cross B now. So I'm doing V cross B, V to the right. Which way is my hand need to turn? Going along the velocity to the right. I need the to, fingers to bend to point on B field out of the page. It needs to be like this. V cross B forces down. So that proton gets shoved that way. Which brings me to 14. This time I see a bunch of uh, a bunch of dots. That's current coming out of the page, or sorry, magnetic field coming out of the page. This one says electron and is a velocity up. We are crossing field lines, so we'll get pushed. I'm gonna go ahead and do V going up, and then field's coming out of the page, so my hand is be like this. V cross B gives me a force to the right, but there's a catch. This is an electron. So it's a negative charge, so you have to reverse the answer at the end. So the force is actually to the left. If it had been a positive charge, V cross B would have been right, but it's a negative, so we flip the direction. And then uh, what do we got here? 15, we've got a proton, yes, a proton going kind of diagonally here across these magnetic fields going there, so we're crossing field lines. And so you say, okay, uh, V cross B, you say, okay, here's my hand. Now, which way do my hand to face? It's got a face so that when the fingers bend, they'll bend and end up pointing along the B field. That's going to be like this. V cross into B. You say, I want my answer to be perpendicular to the plane that contains V and B. Well, that's the plane of the page. So it's got to be either out of the plane or into the page. V cross B going to be into the page, away from us. So I'll draw a little S. And the magnetic force is going into the board, into the page, shoving that charge into the page. And then uh, last one, we've got magnetic field lines going up, and it says electron with the velocity up. And you say on that one, the force would be zero because we are not crossing field lines, we're going parallel to field lines. So there is zero force there. And that is that page. All right, um, I'm going to go ahead and go to the next page. All right, and take a quick look at that. This one I could just actually just draw myself, for heaven's sakes. It's just a uniform magnetic field and a particle going in. But uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and do it here. Shunk, shunk, shunk. All right. Let's see here. This says, uh, the path of a charged particle in the magnetic field, a proton moving horizontally at a speed V enters a uniform magnetic field. Determine the direction of the magnetic force on the proton represented as a vector originating on the proton. Place it down a couple centimeters beyond the original position where you think the proton will be relative to the dashed line. Label as position two. Estimate the direction of the velocity at position two. Then draw the vector representing the magnetic force acting on the proton. Continue this process until you decide the general shape of the path made by the proton. Uh, you say, uh, here we go. And you say, well, here I am at the start, my little positive charge and the velocity is going this way. That's V, right? This little positive charge. There are all these X's. That's magnetic field coming out of the page. Okay, so my B field is coming out. X's. That's in, in. Sorry, I'm looking at the tail feathers, the fletchings. Uh, arrows going away from me into the board. So here we go. Hey, do my right hand roll. V cross B. My hand is B like this. V cross into B forces up. You say, oh gosh, if the force is that way, that's going to nudge that particle that way. It's going to make it start to turn. So two centimeters later, we might estimate this particle to be somewhere like here. And we're nudge nudged. And so now my velocity has been turned. If I push at a right angle to the velocity, that's not going to make me go faster or slower. It's going to make me turn. And so now my velocity vector is that way. And it's not changed in magnitude, right? Work, 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 work. I didn't push with the velocity, I pushed sideways to it. Now I'm going like this, V cross B, again, perpendicular to V. This force is gonna continue shoving at a right angle. That's gonna turn me some more, dirk, 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 right? 
a little bit later, I'll be here. Go in like that. Yeah. Doop, doop. Same size uh, velocity. And so my force, V cross B at a right angle. That magnetic force, the Lorenz force, keeps acting at a right angle, so it's not speeding up or slowing it down. It's just turning this thing. Okay. Uh, I didn't draw that real well. Well, you get the idea. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's right. Point is, you say, hey, what's going to happen? Da, 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 da. We're going to do a semicircular path. Is what should happen. It should be a semicircle. Okay. And then we're going to like exit the field here, going this way, right? Okay. Came in going horizontal. We would go out horizontal. That's the path we would follow. So the point is, hey, the force is always perpendicular to the velocity, so it does not do any work. It doesn't, is it, right? If I do the dot product of f and v, I'd get zero, right? Cosine of 90 is zero. So this isn't doing any work. It's not going to change the speed. It's just going to change the direction that it's going to be a centripetal force, isn't it? <coughs> okay, I believe we did this derivation in class, but uh, just in case we didn't, right? Here we go. If I'm doing a circular motion problem, we're going to use some of the forces in the radial axis, and that'll be mass times acceleration centripetal, isn't it? F equals ma for the radial axis. You say, hey, that force, that's the magnetic force. And that acceleration, that's speed squared over the radius, right? Maybe we're trying to solve for the radius of the turn that we'll make here, right? That might be interesting information for some reason. Hmm. So if we're trying to find that radius, uh, let's go ahead. Whoever says FB, I'll put in my equation, the Lorentz force equation, QB cross B. Okay. Um, now, that cross there, there is a sine theta involved, right? In this case, what's the angle between the velocity and the field lines? Well, the field lines are going into the page. Our velocity is in the plane of the page. That's going to be at a right angle to each other. So that's just sine of 90, which is just 1 in this case. So I just we're not worried about that cross. Hey, now you say, hey, there's a V here. There's a V squared there. We can cancel one of those Vs. Bang, bang. Okay, let's move the QB down there and the R over here. We're trying to solve for the radius of the turn. What we're going to get is that radius is M over Q times V over B. All right? There we go. So that's the equation. That's what I'm getting out. This is not an official AP uh, equation on the formula sheet or anything. These are on the formula sheet. This you would have to derive. Okay? Oh, not the formula sheet. Uh, this you would have to derive. Okay, that's the whole point. Okay, hey, we got this. Let's go to, oh, uh, let me ask you this. Checking this out. What happens if I send a particle, uh, don't, don't, don't look. What happens if I send a particle in that's, uh, say maybe this was a proton, right? Plus one charge. What happens if I send a, uh, instead of sending just a proton in, what if I sent in a lithium plus one ion? It's the same charge, right? But it's just more massive. Is it easier or harder to turn it if it's more massive? If it's more mass, that's, Inertia, F equals ma. The more m, the smaller the a I get out, right? For the same force. The charge is what's getting shoved, right? Same charge, but so the force would be the same, but you say, huh, bigger mass, acceleration is going to be smaller, it's not going to turn as quick, it would go out in a wider turn, right? What if it's uh, the same size charge, right? Uh, so instead of being a proton, right? But maybe we'll make this an electron instead. You say an electron is the same size charge but it's a smaller mass, so it's going to turn quicker, right? But it's negative, so it gets shoved the opposite direction. What's the path look like for an electron? Well, it's going to curve the other way, right? Will it be another big curve this big? Well, no. It's like, remember, it's, it's I forget the number. I should have this memorized by now. It's like 18, 1 18 hundredth the mass. The electron is teeny tiny compared to a proton. So it's going to have, by the way, 1 18 hundredth the radius, right? And so it'll be like, boop. Okay, that's the path of the electron we take, right? We go, poop, and out of the field, right, right away. Um, one eighteen hundred the, the radius. Okay, um, you get the idea. Okay, so what's interesting here is that the path it takes in the field depends on this ratio, the mass to charge ratio of the particle. If you go and you look at the periodic table, and you look at all the different elements, and look at, remember different elements have different isotopes, different versions of an element that have different numbers of neutrons? So like, for example, uh, people always talk about hydrogen, that there's hydrogen, normal hydrogen, protium, it's sometimes called. It has one proton and then an electron, and that's it. But there's also deuterium. That's a hydrogen that has a neutron stuck to it. So you have a proton and a neutron stuck together and an electron going around it. 
That's got twice the mass of the nucleus, right? It's hydrogen 2. You could also have tritium, which is hydrogen 3. It's got two neutrons stuck to a proton, right? And that's my hydrogen nucleus, and i got an electron going around it. And so that would be triple the mass. Um, so the point is, whew, it would have a different mass to charge ratio, right? If you go and you look at all the isotopes and all the different elements, each isotope has its own unique, once you ionize it, it'll have a charge, right? Once you rip off that valence electron, each one has its own unique mass to charge ratio. And so if I could set up a system like this, where I launch into a magnetic field, I can measure the radius of the turn it makes. Maybe I put like a detector here to see where it hits as they come flying out. Different elements will hit at different spots. More massive one hits further out, less massive one hits further, closer in. A higher charge gets tugged in tighter. A, a weaker charge doesn't get tugged as much and it goes further out, right? And so I can find my mass to charge ratio and figure out where it's gonna hit and identify what it is. All right, that's the setup for a device called a mass spectrometer, okay? And the next two pages in the packet are these old AP for response problems with mass spectrometers. Because AP loves mass spectrometer problems, okay? Um, we've uh, talked about these in class, I think. All right, I'm going to go to this one, actually, first. All right, so I think it's a nicer one for talking about how mass spectrometer works. So here in what's called region one, in this area, I put in my unknown ions, right? So I take a sample of my unknown, and what I might do is I might heat it up super hot, right? Oh, fuego, fuego, right? And so it ionizes, it goes in, I strip all the outer electrons off, right? I ionize all my particles, I break all the chemical bonds, and I have just a bunch of miscellaneous ions that if I can identify them, I'll know what into my unknown, into my substance. And so I heat it up super hot with the plasma torch, right? Plasma ionize it. Now I have a bunch of particles moving around. Well, here you see this. Look, that's like a battery, right? Long line, short line, right? Long line. So you say, hey, this then is the high V end, and this is the low V end. It's connected to these two metal plates. So this plate will charge up nice and positive. This plate will charge up nice and negatively, right? What's that going to do to the positive ions, right? Those like positive nuclei I've stripped the electrons off of? You see, those positive ions will get yanked to the right here. There's a little electric field that's going to accelerate them. If I know, like, the delta V here for this battery, and I know the distance, then I can find the voltage, you know, then I can find the electric field in there that's going to accelerate those particles to the right. I might use an equation like delta V is negative integral E dot dr. If these are parallel plates, it's a uniform E field. Integral dr, that's just that whole distance, that whole distance across. You know, I'm going to use uh, dr, ds, whatever. It's just going to be a distance. I'm just going to call it d. Okay, negative e dot d. That's my delta v from one side to the other side in this, this parallel plate capacitor, right? That's what this is, this parallel plate capacitor. Okay, so now here's the deal. These particles will accelerate through. Duh, 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 duh. Now, if they start from rest, then I'll know the delta v they go through. I can do delta v is my ue per q. So q times delta v is my ue. I'll know the potential energy change, yeah, yeah, Q tends delta V, and that's, of course, going to be the kinetic energy change, the kinetic energy I get out. The potential energy I lose is the kinetic energy I gain. So that's like the opposite of the key. Okay, so the point is, uh, you get the idea. We might be able to figure out the speed they'll have if they start at rest. Now, in reality, I've got a problem, and that is when I, if I just heat the stuff up, they're bouncing around at all different speeds, and then they get yanked. They're not going to be having the same speed when they get to the other plate. So I'll we'll have to fix that problem in a second, because that equation we derived was that the radius of the turn, right, was equal to the mass to charge ratio, charge to mass, bigger and bigger, yes, mass to charge ratio uh, times the speed over the magnetic field strength. We need to know what the speed is, but these will be going at all different speeds. So here's the trick. I've got a little hole in the plate, so the particles are going to go zip out. These positive ions. It's like a little, a little positive ion gun. These positive ions go streaming out through that hole. They're going to come out through the magnetic field and they'll get bent around. But the problem is they're going at different speeds, so I won't know if it has that radius because it has this mass to charge ratio because the speed was different, right? So we're going to do a trick in here that will make sure they come out at a set speed. Only ones going a certain speed will make it to this point. This region, region two here, this is called the velocity selector. How does it do it? I've got a bunch of little dots here. That's the magnetic field coming out of the page. Think about it. 
positive charge is going this way, magnetic on the page. V cross V, the force would be down. This is going to bend them. It's going to go at a right angle always to the path, and it's going to bend it around. Uh, so I have my detector here. So here's the trick. What's going on here is I've got two metal plates. They're going to charge up. I'm going to charge them. They're going to hook them to voltage and charge them up to make an electric field that shoves on the charges. So as these positive ions, jerk, jerk, positive, go across, we just established V cross B magnetic force is down. Magnetic force, F sub D, right? The Lorentz force is down. Now, the trick here to make sure that when we get out to here, we know the speed they're going at is to charge up these two metal plates to make an electric field that pushes the other way. So we'll have the magnetic force trying to tug these guys down and the electric force trying to push them up. And only if those forces are balanced will it go in a straight line and make it out that hole. Why does that matter? Hang in there. So if I want this the positive charge to get shoved up by the E field, I need an E field that's going this way which means I need this plate to be the high V plate and this to be the low V plate, yeah? So that way I'm gonna get a force from the E field going up on those positive charges, right? That's where the field lines go. High V to low V, positive to negative, yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, doop, 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 doop. to go in a straight line, those forces have to balance. So I can say the force of the E field has to equal the force of the B field, the magnitudes there. The force of the E field, that's Q times the field strength, right? E is the F per Q. E field strength is F per Q. Rearrange Q times E field strength is F. Right? The electric force per charge, yeah. So the electric force is QB. Magnetic force, that's the Lorentz force, QB cross B. Okay? That cross product means that there's a sine theta hiding in there. But that's the angle between V and B. Look. It's my, my, it's my mass, my velocity selector. I set it up so the B field is going straight out of the page, and the V is this way. They're at a 90 degree to each other. This is going to be sine 90 in this case, which would be just 1. So that cross bit drops out. Hey, what else drops out? Oh, there's a Q here and a Q here. So what I'm going to get now is in order to go straight through and balance these forces, for these to balance, E's got to equal VB, or rearranged, the velocity is going to have to be the rate equal the ratio of the E field strength and the D field strength. I set up this device. I set up the, I choose the magnetic field strength. The electric field strength in here, by changing the voltage, I can set the E field strength there in this distance between the plates. So I can tune that so that I know what the speed is these particles have to have to go in a straight line. And the ones that go in a straight line that have that speed will then exit this hole and go out to this region where the detector's set up and they'll make their little curve and I'll be able to identify what they are because now I know the V and I know the velocity, and I know the magnetic field strength. If I measure the radius, I can solve for the mass to charge ratio, and I can identify my particle. And that's how a mass spectrometer works. Okay? Whew! It's really a mass to charge ratio spectrometer. Okay, it's not a mass spectrometer. It's really, it's a mass to charge ratio spectrometer. But they call it a mass spectrometer. Um, good enough. Okay, that's it. Okay? Um, that's the idea of how mass spec works. Um, we can run through uh, our problems here if we would like. Uh, let's see what they ask. Okay, I don't want this video to get too long. It's probably too late. Uh, but here, let's, let's, let's crank it. Let's crank it. So here we go. Run it real fast. Um, first one says, here's this mass spec. Charges, particles have a charge of, and that should say positive Q. It didn't copy real well, but it should say positive Q. Are accelerated from rest through the potential difference in region one. They're then, so we're starting from rest in this problem. In real life, these probably wouldn't be starting from rest, but eh, whatever. Um, so they get accelerated through, so a delta V there. Um, they get to region two, which has a magnetic field B and an electric field E, right? Finally, the particles enter region three, which contains only the magnetic field B, and they move in a semicircular path of radius R before striking the detector. Magnetic field in regions two and three are uniform, have the same magnetic field B. They're directed out of the page as shown. So it's the same B field strength in here and in here. All right. Uh, question A. In the figure above, indicate the direction of the E field needed for the particles to move in a straight length region two. We already answered that question. The E field lines have to go upward. Okay, and we drew that in here. Look, E going that way. Okay, part B. 
Uh, in terms of any of the quantities Q, B, E, and R, determine the expressions for the speed of the V of the charged particles as they enter region 3. How fast are they going to go in there? We just did that derivation and I erased it, sorry. Uh, the force of the E field has got to balance the force of the B field. And you say that means QE has got to equal QV cross B. Q's drop out. The V has got to be equal to E over B. Okay? And that is my answer for that part. Uh, part C. Uh, what is the mass of the charged particles that make it out? Wait, 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 whoa, whoa, whoa. Am I allowed to use E and B? Yes, those were allowed variables. Okay, we're all good. Okay, what's the mass of the charged particles? Since they told you the radius of the turn here, we can find it. We would do this derivation that we did to find this. Um, so how do we do that, find the mass of the charged particles? You see, that's what we're saying. Um, we're going in a circular path, so we're going to do a circular motion calculation. Uh, that looked like... This is part B, C, part C, yeah. Okay, so we said, hey, I'm going to do uh, sigma f equals ma. I'm doing this for the radial axis. That's centripetal acceleration, so it's speed squared over r. Over here, the, right, the force is just the magnetic force. But out here, there's no E field, it's just the magnetic field. So that's QV cross B, right? That's my velocity, right? Uh, it's m, V squared over r. Very tough of the fact that this angle here, sine theta, between V and B is 90 degrees in this case. We're moving in the plane of the page, and the B field's going perpendicular to the page. It's 90 degrees. And sine of 90 is just 1. So that little cross product is just 1. Um, that little cross product, the sine theta. So I got QVB is MV squared over R. We said, hey, we can drop one of those Vs. Bang, bang. We're trying to solve for what? The mass of the particle. So you say, OK. We're going to move the R and the V to the other side. So we're going to have R Q B over B is M, yeah? Hey, are we done? Well, I should be using their variables. They called the radius big R, so I better call this big R. Okay, I probably should have, might just go back and fix that. Um, Q, they called it big Q. So I'm going to use their notation. Okay. And uh, I am not allowed to have V in my answer, okay? I'm allowed to have Q, B, E, and R. Q, B, E, and R. I'm not allowed to have V, but you know what? We just solved for V back here. V is E over B. So if I put E over B in here, junk, junk, I'm going to get... I don't know. I like to put my alphabetical order. Q over well, that's not really alphabetical. But we're going to get... Uh, sure. R Q B times B is B squared over E. That is the mass of the particle. All right. Uh, then they ask me, hey, what's the accelerating potential in region one? In other words, what's that delta V in here that accelerates these charges? You say, well, we're doing an energy calculation for that. Energy calculation, right. Um, I'm going to go ahead and include my E field in it and have my voltage. So I'm going to have a delta UE. Yeah, yeah. Change in kinetic, change in potential. No outside force doing work here. It's just the E field pushing, but I included the delta UE term. So this is going to be zero. I'll have my kinetic energy at the end minus the kinetic energy at the start plus the... I'm just going to leave this as a delta UE. Now the trick here is our particles are starting from rest as they accelerate from here to here. We're starting end points are going from here to here. Right? Going through that, that E field. And you say, okay, our starting kinetic energy was zero. So what have we got? We got one half mv squared, right? And you say, plus ue, this is where we use the formula that our delta v is our delta ue per q. So q delta v is the delta ue. This is a super handy substitution. We do in energy calculations with particles all the time in E fields. One you should remember. Now, they're calling this accelerating voltage, they just called it big V. It's really a delta V, right? Uh, that's that old notation about not having delta keys on typewriters that led to this. I'm going to use their notation, but I know it's really a delta V. Okay, hey, what's our goal? Our goal is to solve for that V. And I'm like, okay, and the Q, they called it big Q. I'm using their variables again. 
Okay, so rearranging here. Okay, uh, moving over, I got negative one half mv squared over q. Yeah, yeah. Is my v. Right? And you say, okay, uh, again, I'm not allowed to have velocity, but we figured out before the velocity was e over b. So I'll just put that in there. That's an e over b squared, right? So I have minus, um, I'll just move that 2 in the denominator, e squared over b squared, and that's my v. Hey, do I want this to be negative? You say, hey, I'm going from high v to low v. I'm going down v. This is a delta v. I'm going down that much. So it really ought to be negative m e squared over 2 q of e squared. OK, and that's my answer for, what was that, part uh, D. OK, uh, now they want to know part E, the acceleration of the particles in region 3. OK, and you say, well, that acceleration, we're not getting faster or slower, we're just making it turn, right? That's that centripetal acceleration, and yes, we did that calculation. Wait, we did that, wait, what? Am I right? The acceleration of the particles in region 3? Yeah, well, I'm just going to do this. I'm not going to just say F equals MA. It's just V squared over R. Just V squared over R. That's it. So yeah, so I'm just going to say, hey, in um, you know, another color here, in uh, part E, our acceleration is just speed squared over R, and the speed is E over B. So isn't this just E squared over B squared R? I think so. That would be it. OK. And then lastly, they ask, what's the time required for particles to move along the semicircular path? The time to go from here to here. And you say, okay, well, time to go along there is this particle, ex it's accelerating, but am I accelerating in the tangential axis? You say, no, the magnetic field pushes perpendicular. So it's not changing our speed, it's just changing the direction, right? It's a centripetal force. It doesn't change the speed, just the direction. Uh, and so I'm going at a constant speed. Hey, I know what the speed is it's e over b. I know the distance I go, that would be what? Half of a circle of radius r, half the circumference, right? So 2 pi r over 2 is just pi r is the distance. My velocity is distance over time. So looking at this, I'm going at a constant speed. So for that last part, this is part f. I'm just going to say speed is distance over time, right? That's the speed is distance over time, because you're wondering. So my speed is that distance that I go. That's just pi r. Right, half of a circumference, 2 pi r. Right, I'm just going around a half circle, semicircle. You divide it by the time, that's what I'm trying to find, is that time. Yep. Uh, now it's v, I'm going to replace with the expression for v, once again, e over b. This is e over b is pi r over t. Rearranging, what's t? Pi times r times b over e. And that is my answer for that part. Okay, and that's it. That, that's that AP problem. I should really check my answers to make sure I didn't make a uh, bozo no-no somewhere along the line and mess up the calculation. But I think that uh, feels right. It feels right. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, do we want to do one more here on this video? Sure. Why not? Let, let's wrap it. Uh, do do all these all these uh, Lorenz force problems to get them done with. Okay. So taking a look here. Oh, this one's annoying. All right. <laughs> okay. Here we go. <sighs> this is going to be real similar to what we just did, right? But there's some different questions, okay, that they're asking, and that's why I wanted to include it. Um, you also might know, you may remember, that my background is chemical engineering, right? That was my major. So, uh, you know, this chemistry application, talking about different particles and ions, always gets me, uh, you know, Gets me feel warm and gooey inside. Okay, here we go. Hey, a mass spectrometer connected as shown in the diagram above is to be used for determining the mass of singularly ionized, singularly ionized positively charged ion. In other words, things with a charge of plus one elementary charge. There's a uniform magnetic field. B equals, oh my gosh, I'm giving us actual values. Uh, point to Tesla perpendicular to the page in the shaded region of the diagram. So all of this area, there's a magnetic field perpendicular to the page. That means it's either going in or it's going out. I bet they're going to make us figure it out later. In fact, we could do it right now. Look, it's a positive charge, as they tell us, coming in and they get bent this way. Which way is the B field going? Into the page or out of the page? Got to do our right hand rule and work backwards, right? You know, we do V cross into B. 
V going down, I'm going to get shoved this way, right, towards the center of the circle. So I need my thumb to end up pointing toward the center. Oh my gosh, my hand has to be like this. Uh, uh, which means the V field is uh, into the page. V cross B, force toward the center. V field is into the page here. You know what I'm saying? We got a B field going into the page through this whole region. All right, good enough. All right, it's my B. Okay, getting, getting ahead of ourselves there, I know, but moving on. They tell me uh, in that B field that's 0.2 Tesla. Oh, look, they've got coordinate axes here, right? They tell us coordinate axes, they tell us that that is x and y and the positive z is out of the page. You say, they didn't have to tell me that. Once I got x cross y equals z, I know positive z has to be out of the page. Positive x and the positive y cross part equals z. That was nice of them anyway. So our magnetic field is going in the negative z, right, into the page. Okay, moving onward. Um, let's see, they told us the delta v uh, is 1500 volts is applied across the plates L and K. So from here to here, these are charged up. Um, and they tell us that's 1500 volts. I notice they don't tell you which is the high V and which is the low V side. I bet they're going to ask us that. Um, you can kind of anticipate the questions they're going to ask. Um, and they tell the plates are separated by a distance of 0 0.012 meters. Maybe they'll ask us to solve, so maybe we might have to solve the E field strength in there too. Um, and which acts as a velocity selector. Yes, we know that. Okay, in which direction relative to the coordinate system is the magnetic field? We just figured that out. It's got to go into the page in the negative Z. Okay. Uh, should plane K be positive or negative voltage with respect to L, right? Which one needs to be the high V side? You say, well, here come my positive charges. The magnetic field is going to try to shove them that way. We already figured that out, yeah? V cross V is a force to the right. We need the E field to shove it to the left so the force is balanced and it goes straight. So I need my force of the E field to go opposite the force of the B field in the selector here, yeah? And so, work, 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 right? And so you say, oh, well, E field go, force going that way on a positive ion. These are positive ions we're moving. They told us they were singularly positively charged. Guys, go on down. And so you say, well, E field shoved it that way. This has got to be the high V side. E fields go from high to low, right? So that is the deal. K is the positive plate and L is the negative plate. High V and low V, I mean. Um, they don't have to both be positive. They just be high and low V. Uh, so you say, it had better be positive polarity with respect to L. Okay, positive is what that says. Okay. Okay, calculate the magnitude of the E field between the plates. And so again, we're going to say, hey, delta V, that's a V, is negative integral E dot D dr ds, whatever length variable you want. You say, hey, it's a uniform E field with parallel plates, so the E cap pops out. So I'm going to get negative E times dotted with that distance, whatever that is, right? I'm going to call it D. And so you say, negative E dot D, you say, hey, they already told me that the delta V was 1500 volts. And now I know that the E field strength is what I'm trying to find. The D, they told me how far apart they were. They said it was 0 0.012 meters. And so I can do my calculation here. 1500 divided by 0 0.012. Can I do that calculation? Probably if I thought really hard. Ah, uh, 125,000. So that is my E field strength. E is 125,000. What would my units be anyway for E? I'm dividing delta V by D. That would be volts per meter, right? Which is the same thing as a Newton per coulomb. So 125,000 volts per meter. Notice that you do need units on these values, right? Okay, they get points on the AP exam for having units. Um, not every problem and not every time, but often enough and it's good practice. Uh, people know what units are using. Okay, problem, part D it says calculate the speed of a particle that can pass between the parallel plates without being deflected. You know, to go through without being deflected, we need these forces to balance out. So force of the E has to equal force of the B, right? And that means, you know, I'm going to do my work over here. Why am I trying to jam it into the blanks? That's dumb. Uh, force of the E equals force of the B. Force of the E is Q times E. We did this on the last problem. Force of the B is QV cross B. Okay, we are going perpendicular, sine of 90, which is just 1, right? Our velocity is this way, and field is going into the page, right? It's 90 degrees. Uh, the Q is going to drop out. Q 
Keep on both sides. Bang, bang. And so we are able to solve for the speed of the particle that's un undeflected. That speed is going to be E over B. All right, that ratio of the E field to B field. Next, calculate the mass of a hypothetical singly charged ion that travels in a semicircle of radius 0.5 meters. So now we're talking about this motion here, where that radius is a half a meter. Okay. This is, say, say we're going, okay, singly charged. Singly charged, that means it's one elementary charge. It's 1.602 times 10 to 19 coulombs, right? The charge on a proton as it goes around here. And so you say, we're doing circular motion, right? This was part D. Now we're on part E. We do it over here. So part E, we're going to say some of the forces in the radial axis is massive acceleration. So we're doing a circular motion problem. The force is that magnetic force, the Lorentz force. Acceleration is V squared over R, right? Magnetic force is QV cross B. Okay. And again, the angle between V and B is a 90 degree, so this is just sine of 90, which is just 1. Right, so that cross product goes away. Um, looking at this, one of the V's is going to drop out. There's a square there and a V there, right? Uh, I'm trying to solve for what again? The velocity, yeah? No, the mass, the mass of the particle that goes at a radius of a half a meter. Okay, so I'm trying to find M. Let's move the R up here and the V down there, right? So we are going to get QB uh, multiplied by R divided by V. That's my mass. I know the charge. It's one elementary charge. That's 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, right? I know the B field strength. They told me that the B field strength was 0.2 Teslas. It's a fifth of a Tesla. They told me the radius is a half a meter. And they told me the speed. They tell me the speed? No, but I figured it out here. It's E over B, right? So that speed was E over B. Oh, I probably should have flipped my values and got actual numerical values for this, shouldn't I? Silly, silly of me. Sorry about that. Okay, what's the E field strength? Well, we figured it out in the previous part. Sorry, I'm going backwards that one. E field strength is 125,000, right? I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I forgot that we're working with real numbers here. 125,000 um, divided by my magnetic field strength at 0 0.2. Uh, we do that calculation for the speed. Um, that's a fifth, right? So it's like five times that. That'll be 625,000 meters per second. Holy cow, it's fast. Oh yeah, little tiny ions that can go real quickly. It's really easy to accelerate. Okay, so that's the speed that gets plugged in down here. 625,000. Okay. We used to have a uh, AP Calc teacher who hated it when people talked about plugging into equations. She's like, substitute into the equations. Okay, uh, you know what? This is time for my calculator now, right? Okay, to find that mass. Let's give it a try, right? Notice I got this 10 to the negative 19 power here. We're going to get an itty bitty mass, which makes sense. We're doing the same little ion. Uh, here we go to the calculation. Well, 1.602 times 2 times 0.5 divided by. So I got a mass of 2.5. 5.6 times 10 to the negative, uh, what's 19 and 7? 26 kilograms. Okay? Incidentally, right, um, you know that, like, you know that? You know? You know the mass of a proton? Mass of an electron is 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms. Mass of a proton is something about 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. Um, why do you think I think of the mass of a proton on the top of my head? Uh, 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27. So if a proton estimate then how many protons this would be, right? This is like uh, 25.6 divided by 1.67, right? That's about 15 protons worth of mass. So 15 protons worth of mass, 
That might be, uh, looking at my periodic table, 15 protons worth of mass, might be something like a oh, boron, maybe like a boron ion, yeah, which is element, no, no, what am I saying? What am I saying? That's silly. No, 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 15, 15, sorry. It's probably like a nitrogen ion, right? It might be like nitrogen 15 or something, maybe. Maybe, maybe. Oh, no, it's, it's got to be a plus one ion, right? So, yeah, it's so like, like a, a nitrogen minus, my nitrogen plus one ion. Imagine that we stripped uh, some electrons off of That's weird. Okay, but anyway, good enough. Moving onward. Um, that was part E, uh, was getting this. Okay, uh, now we move on to part F. Says, a doubly ionized positive ion of the same mass and velocity. We just made the charge twice as big, that's all. Um, enters the mass spec. Well, it's going to the same, you now the velocity we, we come out at here, Remember that that velocity only depends on the E field strength and the B field strength. It doesn't matter what mass the particle is, doesn't matter what charge the particle has, as long as it's positive, right? It will make it out, whoop, right, in a straight line if its speed matches this ratio. And so the point is then, uh, which we're going to do, is then we launch it in. But once it gets out here, it doesn't have the E field to balance it out. Now we're just looking at this, right? And now I have twice the charge. So I just track through. And they want to know about what again? The radius of its path. So I'm going to take this equation, and instead of solving for mass, we're going to solve for radius. Move the r over here and the qb over there, right? So my radius, mv over qb. Now the v is e to b. There's my equation for the radius. We've got the same mass, doubly ionized positive ion, same mass and velocity. Oh, I didn't need to sub in velocity then, I guess. But the point is, this is all the same. The only thing we change now is the Q. We make the Q twice as big. So this side equals this side. If I double the Q, I'm putting a two on the bottom. It's gotta be a half, right? That's a Q, by the way, in case you were wondering. We doubled the charge. We gotta, we gotta have the radius. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, it's the same mass and everything, but we, we have twice the charge means the magnetic field shoves twice as hard on it, yanks on it twice as hard, and tugs us inward like that. All right, hot diggity. Am I happy with that? Yes, I am. I'm happy with that, I'm pretty sure. Yup. Okay, uh, hey, that's it, that's, that's the problem. All right, hope that was good.